I'm Dave Henson from Present with Vision. Are you tired of boring your audience to tears with lacklustre slides? If so, join me for a talk that will revolutionise your presentations. You'll discover when to use slides and, just as importantly, when to ditch them completely. You'll learn how to make your slides your trusty sidekick, your partner on stage and screen and you'll master the art of captivating visuals and killer animations. And yes, you'll even learn how slides can save lives. My Big View talk on Thursday the 4th of April is aimed at fundamentally changing the way you think about presenting when using slides. Come along to learn how to wow your audience and ensure that your message hits home. I look forward to seeing you there. Hey, Big View brethren or Big View band, whatever your preference, welcome to another Big View educational session. We're so glad that you're here. You know why? Do you know why? Because this doesn't work without you, my friends. <laughs> without you, we're just here talking into our microphones for fun, except without the fun part. Yes, it's you, my friends. You bring the fun to this fantastic time together. In case I didn't tell you, my name is Robert Kennedy the Third, RK3. That's me. I run a company called Kinetic Communications, and we work with real estate professionals and small business owners, showing them how they can better attract, connect, and more confidently communicate with their clients and customers using the art of storytelling. Well, enough about me. Today, we're here to talk about you as in how you can transform your slides and presentations in five easy steps, not six, not seven, five simple steps. And to do that, we've got a phenomenal presenter today. But before I introduce him, I just want to acknowledge some of the people in the room. Let's see who's in the place today. We've got, oh yeah, Stuart Harris from PSA Scotland. I like it. Come on. Erskine Edwards. Do me a favor. Just put where you are and who you're, where you're coming in from in the chat for me. All right. San Diego in the house. How you doing? All right. I love it. Somebody from Canada. I am old Betty I'm messing up your name. Sorry about that, my friend. All right. <laughs> Glasgow, Scotland. Stuart Harris. Good. All right. Koto Anzurini. Love it. My gosh. Johannesburg, South Africa. Claire Crowther from Cornwall, England. Roland Manny from Ohio. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Goodness. We've got some great people in the space today, and we're going to get some fantastic information from our presenter today. All right. Well, listen, let's jump on in. I'm glad you're here. This is not just a talk at your session. We want to take your questions. So if you have a question, please type Q followed by your question in the comments. So it's easy for us to separate the questions from all of the dad jokes that you all normally put in the chat. <laughs> all right. So let's do this thing. Our guest today used to work with 35 millimeter slides. You know, the ones that had negatives that had to be developed in a dark room with red lights. Ooh, 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 scary. <laughs> One day after listening to a great speaker with terrible slides, he resolved to go on a crusade to eradicate excruciatingly boring visual communications and teach people how to produce slides and presentations that wow their audiences and make their talks memorable and effective. He's the author of the book, Your Slides Suck. <laughs> Let's welcome Dave Henson. Hey, Dave, how's it going, my friend? Are you are you related to the dude that did the Muppet Show? <laughs> no, yeah, um, I, 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 I have been I have been called I have been called a Muppet on several occasions, but I'm not related to Jim Henson. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Thank you so much for coming in today. It's going to be a good time. I can tell. Well, it's my pleasure. I love By it. By the way, I, I have to point out, as, as, as I'm quite a pedantic sort of person, Robert, if you did try developing 35 mil slides with the red lights on, you'd, you'd end up ruining all the slides. You have, oh, to do man. It total, you have to do it in total darkness. Oh, my gosh. Okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. So you've been in this place for a little bit. What For those that don't know, for those that were born in, like, 1995 or later, what exactly... <laughs> 
our, our 35 millimeter slides, man. Yeah, well, we did it back in the old days. You know, we used to. So, so the reason they're called slides, you know, PowerPoint slides, is because back in the day they used to be a two by two inch little slide that you'd put into a projector. Yeah. And you would produce them um, in the simplest form. You would have to produce black and white artwork to start off with. And then you would shoot that onto a very high contrast black and white film. And then you would put that into um, a, a color box and shoot with 35 mil color film in it. And then you would shoot your blue background, wind the film back, shoot the white text. So to produce like a white on blue text slide would take you a day rather than two minutes. You know, wow. so um yeah so we 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 did the hard miles in those days wow so so the process back then of having a presenter with a slide deck before we got what was powerpoint i'm having a little bit of trouble with my camera today it seems i'm a little bit glitchy but we'll get that fixed in a moment but before before we had powerpoint um you know what was it like what was the process that a speaker or presenter had to go through in order to get their slide decks done. Well, you send them a physical a physical set of slides in a in a slide box, and they would then go into a, a carousel, a round yeah. carousel, which would go on top of a projector, yeah. which would then project those um, transparencies onto onto a screen. Um, I when when I started my first company in 1986, we we did it with computer graphics, mm -hmm. so we'd have to um, produce the slides on a. It was an Apple IIe. Um, oh, it had no hard disk, three five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Um, and it had 64 colors and two fonts and, uh, and the system cost 7,000 pounds. So that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, nowadays you can get a phone for 500 quid that does something a million times quicker than, um, that system did. And then I'd have to send it via modem to an imaging bureau to start with until we got our own recording yeah. film recorder and the bureau would image the 35 mil signs, send them back to us and they go off to the client wow. and the modem speed, by the way, for those of you that are used to like 256 megabytes was 300 bits per second, not <laughs> megabytes, not kilobytes, 300 bits per second. Wow. Because, because I'm quite a sad person. I worked out that if you had a 300 bits per second modem and downloaded a film, it would take about 16 months. That's how slow the modem was. Wow. <laughs> wow. So the process was definitely quite a bit different. And I'm sure you've seen the good, the bad, the ugly. You've seen all of it uh, over, over your time here. So why don't you go ahead and jump into your presentation? Tell us a little bit about how to get rid of the excruciatingly boring slides and how to upgrade them into things that are fantastic and phenomenal and, and engaging. Okay, I will start the presentation and um, let's go from here. Okay, so today I have a really important message. Um, message that you've actually already heard from, from Robert, which is the title of my book. And that message is that your slides suck. So, so welcome everybody to this Big View workshop. What do I mean when I say your slides suck? Well, think about it, right? Your company's brochures, report and accounts, the videos, your corporate branding, your stationery, your website, they don't suck because you tend to give those to professionals to design and produce them for you. But your slides, well, you trust them to people like Simon from sales or Layla from HR or Imram from production or Dawn, your uh, marketing director, or Ella, the client account manager, or Steve, the finance director. And the one thing that these people all have in common is that they were taught how to use PowerPoint by a teacher at school, an IT teacher. Um, incidentally, I was taught uh, woodwork at school and um, my shelves suck. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, Simon, Layla, Imran, Dawn, Ella and Steve are all really good at their jobs, but they've never been trained to create compelling and effective visual communications. And add to that the fact that they probably have to use an awful corporate template. And it all adds up to the fact that when they're presenting, they're on stage or even on screen, they're probably staring out at a a sea of unengaged faces, people staring at their phones or looking out of the window, or worse still, getting up and walking out of the room. 
And the consequences of bad slide presentation, of bad visual communication can be very serious to your organization. It can damage your brand, it can harm your reputation, and it will almost certainly destroy the message that you're trying to get across. So today, what's the big WIFM? W-I-I-F-M, which stands for what's in it for me or what's in it for you tonight's audience or this afternoon's audience, depending on where you are in the world. Well, in the next 40 minutes, my aim is twofold. Firstly, it's to fundamentally change the way that you think about presenting when using slides. And secondly, hopefully, to maybe give you a newfound respect for PowerPoint. I'm going to outline five things that you can do that will make a massive difference to your slime presentations. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. If you want to put questions in the chat, Robert will be monitoring the chat. We're going to have a Q&A session after the second point, which is uh, after, after the rice section. And we'll also have a Q&A section at, uh, at the end. So let's, let's crack on. The first point is to declutter. So, as I said, bad visual communications will have an adverse effect on your organization. This adverse effect may be financial or it may be reputational, but it could be more serious than that. And this was brought home to me by a slide that I was compelled to create back in 2020, a slide that was never used, but a slide that garnered a lot of comments on LinkedIn, two of which made me stop and think. The date was October the 31st, 2020. It was 4 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon. And in the UK, many of us were sat around our TVs to watch the Prime Minister giving a news conference. This was a few Prime Ministers ago, by the way. We seem to be getting through Prime Ministers quite quickly in the UK at the moment. Um, the Prime Minister, along with two scientific advisors, was there to give us all a very important message. And the message was that Christmas was cancelled. We're going to be in lockdown over Christmas. And the slide that they used to justify this message was this one. You probably already guessed this slide sucks. So in the UK, we all became very familiar with the phrase, next slide, please, as the speakers at the news conference use it to signal that we should then be subjected to the next awful slide in their presentation. So let's have a very quick whistle stop tour of all the things that make this slide suck. Okay, so first of all, you've got this title, England new SPI-M combined projection bed usage. Does anyone know what SPI-M stands for? I've done this presentation a few times and no one has ever been able to come up with what it stands for. It stands for Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Modeling. Who knows? Who cares? It's not important to the audience. Don't forget, this slide is going out across the country to people from all kinds of different backgrounds. The title is meaningless and confusing. Then you've got V-beds. I didn't know what V-beds was. I actually had to watch the um, the news conference back on the government website, so I had to take a bullet for the scene with that one. Um, but it stands for ventilator beds. So on the left, you've got acute beds. On the right, you've got uh, ventilator beds. Then you've got the, um, the legend. The legend's on there twice. Um, that's because there's two graphs, but I'll, I'll come to that again in a minute. And then I don't know what's going on here with this uh, X axis. It's dropped onto two lines. It's got a, a very strange way of kind of delineating the X axis. I think it's every fortnight, but it's really quite confusing. Now, then you've got the sources. Now, I know that the sources are really important from the point of view of credibility. But when you're presenting a slide that's only going to be on the screen for a couple of minutes, you've got to make sure that the slide is decluttered to get the point across, the point that you want to make. I think if you're producing the handout, then the sources can go on there. But I would suggest taking the sources off of this slide. Um, you can always mention it when you're talking as to where the, the information came from. Same thing with this. This is an admirable sentiment. This is a, one of the slogans that we used in the UK, hands, face, space. But it has no place on this particular slide it doesn't add any value to it and then you've got all these gubbins going on you've got blue text you've got purple text you've got green text and lines and dotted lines and arrows and all sorts of things going on which makes it really confusing and finally there's this you've got two charts two charts on the slide with almost exactly the same trend you don't need to have two charts on the same slide but the most important part of this slide is this part here. 
because this part here contains the all important message that this slide is trying to get across the three dates by which if we do nothing we will exceed some very uncomfortable milestones so when i saw this on the tv obviously it was too late to do anything about it but i felt compelled to produce um, a better version of it so this is my version of this same slide we start off with a title that says projected bed usage acute beds in england okay that's a an easily understandable title it's tucked up nice and high on the slide with the nhs logo tucked in the top corner and we've got all that nice space underneath to uh, to get our message across so then we draw the the graph and the graph is as simple as you can make it the the months are delineated um, by using these light blue and dark blue colors and then the y-axis goes from zero to beyond forty thousand. it's very simple and easy to understand and then we can start explaining about the the trend in bed usage so it went up at the beginning of the pandemic and peaked in um, early april it tailed off during the summer and it's going back up again to the point where we are now at the end of october 2020 and if we do nothing that's going to continue to rise within a certain tolerance and if we do nothing by the 20th of november we will have exceeded the previous peak as you can see from that yellow area on the slide just three days later we will have used up all of the currently available beds in the national health service and just 10 days after that we will have had to start uh, postponing some hospital services and operations so i hope you'll agree this is a lot better than the government's original slide we've basically taken out all of this superfluous uh, detailed information we've decluttered the slide and we've just left on that slide the information that we need to get the point across but could we take this idea and this data one stage further maybe by telling a compelling story something like this if we do nothing then by the 20th of november we will have exceeded the april peak for bed usage just four days later we will have used up all of the available beds in the nhs and then just 10 days after that by the 4th of december the nhs will be overwhelmed and we'll have to start cancelling operations so we're taking the the data and telling a story using emotional pictures you've got the rushed emergency department you've got the old man on the ventilator and then you've got the exhausted nurse and when people saw these two versions of the slides that i created a couple of people commented that these slides could save lives and i thought wow isn't that um, an amazing thought that using well-designed uncluttered slides could save lives so we went from this original government slide we determined what we thought was wrong with it i then produced an uncluttered clean and hopefully much more understandable version and then finally a slide with just 13 words on it and powerful pictures to appeal to the emotions all right a quick slurp and we'll move on to talk about rice now you're probably wondering what the heck has rice got to do with slides well you may have guessed that rice is an acronym that i use and it stands for reinforce illustrate clarify and explain in other words if you've got a point that you're making in your presentation that could be reinforced or or, or illustrated or clarified or explained by the use of a graphic or a visual or a slide call it what you will then it's a good candidate for firing up powerpoint and producing that slide or that visual let me explain what i mean by these four points if i was to tell you that forty-seven thousand dogs were abandoned in the past 12 months you'd probably feel very sad but if i was to tell you that forty-seven thousand dogs were abandoned in the 12th in the past 12 months with this slide on the screen well it makes you feel even sadder because you've got this little dog with his doleful eyes staring out as his owner deserts him um, by the way no dogs were actually harmed in the making of this presentation but that's an example of reinforcing a point see what i mean so you've got this image that reinforces the point that you're trying to make moving on to i which is illustrate if i was to talk to you about the quality of the light and the perspective in jan vermeer's painting the music lesson what are you thinking you're thinking well, Dave show us a picture so I can illustrate the point 
I can show the quality of the light and the perspective in this painting by Vermeer. Um, and you can see it on the screen. So that's an example of illustrating a point that I'm making. C is for clarification. So here we have Earth and Jupiter. And if we shrink and expand them to their relative sizes, we can see that the Earth fits into Jupiter's great red spot three times over. Now, you could also say this is an example of illustration, which it is. So it's, it kind of can get a kind of crossover between some of these points. And finally, the E is for um, explanation. So here is a simple diagram explaining the electricity generation process where the wind turbine generates the electricity. It is then goes through a goes through a transformer to step up the voltage for transmission. Step three is where it is transmitted across the grid. Step four is where it hits another transformer that steps down the voltage. And step five is where the electricity is made available to your home. So it's a, it's a very simple diagram, admittedly, but it's an explanation of what you're talking about. I could have done that without a slide, but putting the slide on the screen hopefully gets the message home, uh, gets the message through much, much better. But here's the point. If you're making a point in your presentation that doesn't need to be reinforced or illustrated or clarified or explained by a slide, then don't be afraid to go blank. Not you obviously, but the screen. If you're presenting from stage, put a, a black slide in your presentation. Um, if you're presenting online as we are today, then either put a black slide in your presentation if it's brief or stop, stop sharing your screen for a little while. Um, but as I say, it's quite this is quite brief, so I can, I can move on to, to the next stage. But um, don't be afraid to go blank. You can, hit a, you can hit the B key on your keyboard or sometimes your clicker might have the option to blank the screen. I always prefer to put actual black slide in the presentation because you can fade into it. And when you come out of it again, you go on to the next slide like this. And I'm going to talk next about images. But before I do, I want to find out, Robert, if there's been any questions so far. Yes, we do have one question. And I have a question myself about what you just demonstrated. So we've got a question from Claire, which says, I love the action on the electric slide. How do you do that? <laughs> so yeah, well, your transitions and your animation. Hi, Claire. If that's if that's Claire Corral, though, we're long time no speak. Nice to nice to hear from you. Um, yeah. So okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about animations a little bit later on. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically done using the PowerPoint animations, which are really really powerful, and if used with purpose, can really make a difference to your, to your presentation. The um, the turbine actually was a was an animated gif file that i created so it's slightly more complicated um but that that could have been done actually using powerpoint you could have done that <coughs> using powerpoint um the uh the, the build up of the points from one to five is just simple fading animations on um, on powerpoint so it's actually it's not a difficult thing to do um, but it's, it is worth, if you're going to learn how to use PowerPoint, it's worth learning how to really get into um, animations. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Speaking of animations, there are different animations that happen with different pieces of software. So, for example, Stuart Harris is asking, he says he's a Mac user and prefers Keynote, but sometimes they've got to go old school and send a PowerPoint to a client. Um, <laughs> any thoughts or any suggestions about that? Yeah, hi Stuart. Nice to uh, nice to hear from you. Um, yeah, get get PowerPoint, Stuart. Simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, most of the time you will find that conferences and organisations will want PowerPoint. Now you can export PowerPoint from Keynote. You, you can't export Keynote from PowerPoint, but you can you can do it the other way around. Obviously, you may end up with problems when doing that there is not an easy solution to be quite honest yeah. um you just have to go if, if someone wants powerpoint you, but you, the best bet is to find someone who's um who's um, an expert in slide production um i don't know if i can think of anybody and um and ask them to convert it for you but um but yeah there isn't an easy way around that to be quite honest love it Stuart says it's not as cute as keynote well i mean my my uh, opinion on that is that these are all tools whether you use powerpoint yeah keynote or google slides or prezi or or, or ai or whatever you use yeah. um it's just a tool and it's and the most important thing is to learn how to communicate and i'm sure that's something that Stuart and i would probably agree on so uh, it doesn't matter what tool you use as you, you've got to communicate um properly using that tool 
Fantastic. Fantastic. So I do have one more question before we go to the question. I just want to have everybody know that if you stay around to the end of the presentation, Dave has a giveaway that he's going to share with you. So make sure that you stay around so that you can get information about that. Last question. You just talked about going to black if you want to have them focus on your message or your voice a bit more. In this case, right now, you are you're black. Your screen was black and you were in a small square at the side of the screen. And that can be the yep. case when you're sharing on Zoom as well. You go to black, but you're still in a little square as a speaker. Yeah. Do you have yeah. any recommendations around that? Well, that's, that's what I basically was saying, is if you're, if you're going to go to a black screen just temporarily or briefly, it's not the end of the world if the screen goes black. If you're going to do it for a prolonged period, then I would, I would stop sharing the screen. Yeah. I, would, I would say, let's not share the screen anymore because I want you to focus on me and my story and what I'm saying rather than the, the visuals. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I would, you, you don't want to put a black screen up on, on Zoom or Teams or, or, or this, this sort of channel for too long because it just looks silly, doesn't it? You've got a big black box there with just <laughs> you on the right-hand side. Um, but as it, because it was only temporary and because I was kind of making a point about the black yep. screen, it, it didn't make a, it, it, was, it wasn't particularly um, a, a particular problem, I don't think. Fantastic. Yep. Just wanted to bring that out so that everybody gets it. They're like, Dave said I should use black slides sometimes. Uh, all right. Yeah, it, works, it works much better on stage, obviously, because you can go black and then people will, will just focus on you then, which is, yeah. what, which is what you want. Particularly right. if, you're telling, if you're telling a personal story, more often than not, I will say do it without slides because right. um, the slides can sometimes actually detract from the story that you're telling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Love it. Let's, cool. let's keep jumping. You said there are five things we've gotten through two. Yeah. Let's jump. Okay, let's move on to talk about um, the all-important aspect of images. <coughs> Excuse me. So, why use images and why is the use of images important when presenting? Well, the first point is, this might sound slightly frivolous, but there's less room for text. In, in my book, the less text on the slides, the uh, the better. Um, so, that's, that's always a good point. It's actually more fun. It's more fun to produce slides with images as the producer of the slides but also more fun for the audience. But the most important thing, and there are studies that have um, looked into this, is that it will make your slides more memorable and effective. However, I think that there are a few things that you should definitely avoid when using images on slides. So let's just go through, first of all, what I think you should avoid when using images on slides. First thing is I think you should avoid using cliches. So it's this kind of thing where you say, we've hit our target. I know, let's put a dart ball with a with a dart in the bullseye um we've we've signed we've got a new client i know it's so someone signing a contract or your could you fit in with our team a, a jigsaw and of course there's the handshake it's if in doubt just bung a picture of a handshake on your slides <laughs> you know it's kind of the default picture that people bung on their slides the other thing i don't like which is the, i think is even worse is this kind of corporate image I think what happens here is people think, well, I'm I'm presenting about my business to people who are in business. Therefore, let's put a picture of business people on the slide. And I kind of think this is just the visual equivalent of bullet points and should be avoided, in my opinion, at all costs. The second thing I think you should avoid is using clip art. Now, I don't mean good quality illustrations or cartoons. I'm kind of talking about this sort of thing that... Um, might have been acceptable in the 1980s. Um, maybe you got away with it in the 90s, but certainly has no place in the uh, in the 21st century. Um, and also, I don't particularly like these um, stick men, um, these stick men figures that uh, seem to be quite ubiquitous. Um, someone did point out to me, actually, they quite like them because they are kind of um, gender neutral. Um, and I said, yeah, but they're still called stick men, aren't they? So I try to avoid these stick men if, if, if at all possible. It goes without saying, well, almost goes without saying that you shouldn't use low resolution images. Here's a handshake again, which is a low resolution image that's um, been plonked on this slide and looks really, really awful. You can also see that it's got the um, the Shutterstock logo on it, which means that it brings us nicely onto the fourth point. The thing that you should avoid is theft, copyright theft. If you do a search for, let's say, public speaking in Google Images, you'll end up with a bunch of results, something like this. And it's easy to lift one of those images out of Google Images and put it onto your slides. But those images, or most of those images, will um, be, the, the copyright will be owned by someone. So effectively, you're stealing. It's a bit like going into uh, into the supermarket and, and pinching a packet of digestive biscuits or whatever biscuits you have in whatever country you are <laughs> tuning in from. Um, you know, you might be able to get away with it, but it's it's not right. 
And there are plenty of sources of free and cheap images across the web and online these days. I use um, a, a, a library called uh, Pixabay. Also use Unsplash. Both of those are free images. I used to use Shutterstock. I now use Adobe Stock only because I have got the um, Adobe Creative Cloud subscription. Um, they're not free, but they're very, very cheap. And then there's Creative Commons. Now, Creative Commons is effectively a license to use images. Um, and there's various levels of the license, the, 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 the bottom one of which CC0 means you can use it free of charge. Um, and I think, see, that I can't remember what they're all called, but there's one where you have to put a little attribution to the photographer on the slide or on the, on the picture, wherever you're using it. One of the good things about Creative Commons is that there are a lot of images in the public domain. So for example, if you're using, if you find an image that, um, where the author in the UK and I think the US, where the author has been dead more than 70 years, it normally goes into the public domain and you can use that image free of charge. And we'll be seeing some examples of that um, a little bit later. If in doubt, take a picture yourself. This is a speckled wood butterfly that was in my garden last year. Um, it's ab ab absolutely no purpose in putting that slide on the screen other than to say I took it myself. I own the copyright in that. The, um, the butterfly doesn't have any image rights apparently. The fifth thing I think you should avoid is what I call small images. And what I mean by that is things like this, the search for ET, the title at the top, the picture underneath, and all that horrible white space around the outside. Instead, why not do something like this? You fill the slide with your image and you put the text on top in a nice typeface with a little bit of black glow around the edge to lift it off. And that looks so much more classy and so much more professional. So just to recap on the things that I think you should avoid, they are cliches, clip art, low resolution images, copyright theft, and small images. So if those are the things you should be avoiding, what should we be looking at doing instead? Okay, so we want images that are impactful, don't we? We want to make an impact with our audience. Images that are colorful. Now there's no, there's no problem with using monochrome images, but um, colorful images, maybe like this one, will certainly have more of an impact, more of an effect. Images that are quirky. You might say this image is quite quirky. Images that are different, by which I mean not cliched images that are amusing. So if you can bring a bit of humor in, whether it's verbal humor or visual humor into your presentation, again, it makes your me me your, your message, sorry, more memorable. Um, you might think, again, this slide is quite amusing unless you suffer from what's known as chorophobia or the fear of clowns, um, in which case you'll probably want to be to move on quite swiftly. Um, but the final point is use images that are relevant. Again, you can think about using rice here. Does the image reinforce or illustrate or clarify or explain the point that you're trying to make in your presentation. <clears throat> so, I want to look at a couple of image usage examples now. Here we have a typical bullet point slide. And we know what's gonna happen on this. The presenter's gonna start reading it and the audience is gonna start reading it at the same time. And the presenter will be reading point two whilst the audience is already on point five, and there's this kind of cognitive um, problem between listening and reading at the same time. Um, and it really it really doesn't work. I always talk about your slides being congruent with you rather than clashing. So to make this congruent, how can we how can we do that in a very simple way? Okay, so we start off with a picture of lavender. You can almost smell it, can't you? And the title, The Benefits of Lavender. And then we bring up each point one at a time, but we do it with minimal words. So the first point is eliminate nerves. And now I, as the presenter, talking about the benefits of lavender, can tell you how lavender helps to eliminate nerves. Um, I don't actually know how lavender helps to eliminate nerves, but apparently it does. And then I can go on to the next point. Benefits of lavender helps to relieve pain. And I can talk around these points one at a time, and the audience is focused on just the point that I'm talking about, and they can't read ahead and they can't second guess what I'm going to say after that. And that is very, very easy to do in PowerPoint. That is that that block of text from eliminate eliminates nerves down to um, treats respiratory problems is all one block of text, and you can use PowerPoint's animation to build them up one line at a time very, very easily. 
Here's another slide. This is a second example. And again, exactly the same thing. You've got five bullet points talking about the features of a camera. It contains large, bright display that can easily be seen in full sunlight, blah, 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 blah. Pretty worth this picture of the camera at bottom right. And again, the audience will be reading ahead of the presenter. And this one um, comes into another one of my kind of mantras. And that is, it's, it's always worth thinking about this as always just put one point per slide. So we have a slide here that has five points on it. Instead of doing one slide, think about doing five slides. So the first point that I want to talk about is the large bright display. So we've got here a really nice picture of the large bright display on the camera and simply three words, large bright display. That's the kind of the minimum amount of words you could put on that slide to talk about a large bright display, isn't it? But now again, I as the presenter can talk around that. I can give you all the technical details that you need about the large bright display. And it's kind of the way that Steve Jobs used to present when launching um, Apple products. He would show big images of the products of minimal text. And we can go on and show each of the other five points with a picture, or in this, in, in this case, three pictures, because we're talking about the ergonomic design. And the presenter can talk around those points, and the slides remain congruent with the presenter rather than clashing with the presenter. Okay, so section four, I want to go and talk, go on to talk about animations. So you've already seen a lot of usage of animations in the preceding slides, but I want to talk about animations in a little more detail in this section. But before I do, it's worth me pointing out that animations should be used with care and purpose and not just for the sake of it, like on this slide. Random, purposeless animations can confuse the audience and even leave them feeling a little bit groggy. Um, and in fact, again, you can use rice. Does the animation reinforce or illustrate or clarify or explain the point that you're making? If it doesn't, then you're probably just using it as a gimmick or at random. So I'm going to show you two examples of creative animations that will serve three purposes. First one is to give you an appreciation of how animation can be used purposefully to get information across to your audience. The second is to show how PowerPoint can be used creatively and to hopefully give you that newfound respect for PowerPoint that I mentioned earlier. And as a bonus, you might learn a couple of new things. So the first example, I'm going to talk about the six wives of Henry VIII, England's probably most famous monarch. Um, one thing that we all know probably across the globe about Henry VIII is that he had six wives. And I thought, well, it might be quite a nice idea to make up an animation concerning Henry VIII, six wives. So the slide you're looking at at the moment just basically contains the data that I need to produce the animation, the wives, when he married them, when he stopped being married to them for one reason or another, and the number of years and months that he was married to those wives. And so I'm going to run through this automated sequence now of Henry VIII and his six wives. This is just running through. I'm not, I'm not clicking through. It's running through of its own accord. And I want to talk about what's going on here. So we're using up, we're using build-up animations one wife at a time is appearing on the screen, details of the wife, and then that timeline on the left-hand side going around the image of Henry. This was all done in PowerPoint. This can all be done in PowerPoint. It was what was all done in PowerPoint. As I mentioned before, the images, because these are all paintings that were painted in the 16th century, they're all in the public domain and free to use. So I'm able to use all these images without a problem. I'm also using the morph transition. I think it's called magic move in um, in Keynote. It's a similar sort of thing. But the morph transition helps to kind of link all these together. It, do, it doesn't mean the slide isn't jumping about all over the place. You can see the movement of the slide and how it all fits together. And then you end up with this final slide. And it's important if you're creating a sequence like this to always start with the last slide first to make sure that everything you want is going to fit on the slide. So I would have, when I produced this, I produced this slide first that you can see on the screen now with the six wives, the, the, the little icons, a uh, picture of Henry VIII and the timeline around the outside. <coughs> Excuse me. And what I learned about this when I was, when I was doing it, because I, I, I actually studied Tudor history at school. And, you know, you're probably looking where you can tell that I was at school a long time ago, but um, I didn't realize that, Henry VIII had been married to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, for as long as he was, a lot longer than he was married to his other five wives put together. And I also didn't realise, as you can see from the grey bits on the timeline, 
that there were parts of Henry VIII's reign where he wasn't married at all. So by producing this visual, um, this, this sort of like infographic, I learned something new from that as well. Moving on, similar sort of thing. I don't know whether, that, whether in your country you use acres and hectares as a measure of land measurement. In in this country, apparently in the UK, we've been using hectares now, the, the, the decimal measurement since 2016 officially, but people still talk about acres and hectares. And I always kind of wonder what the difference was. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make a little um, visualization of this. So this, again, this slide shows all of the, the data that we need. We could just show this slide and it would explain everything. But again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this as a visualization. And again, all of this was done in PowerPoint. Um, and what I'm going to do, what you'll see that I'm doing with this, is going back to the other mantra I mentioned earlier, one point per slide. Okay, so what is the difference between an acre and a hectare? Well, an acre is a chain by a furlong. Okay, so let's clear that up, isn't it? So, what is a chain? Okay, a chain is the length of a cricket pitch. Now, I realised when 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 I'm showing these slides that it's slightly UK centric or maybe British Commonwealth centric. If you don't play cricket in your country, um, you can take it from me that the length of a cricket pitch between the stumps is 22 yards. So that's a chain. Okay. Now, furlong is another measurement of length, which is 220 yards, about 200 meters, which is a distance which is used in horse racing. So one acre is 220 yards by 22 yards. Um, or to put it in a more sensible format, 44 yards by 110 yards. Now, you see what I did there? I used the morph transition to, to shrink that box down so that it clearly linked to the previous slide. And again, I'm going to use the morph transition to go on to the next slide, which shows you exactly how big an acre is in comparison to a football pitch. Um, and when I say a football pitch, again, for those of you tuning in from um, the US, I'm talking about proper football. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, a hectare, on the other hand, is, as I said, is a metric measurement, and it's 100 metres square. So a hectare is about two and a half acres. Okay, so again, you can see the use of the morph transition between those slides. And again, I'm going to use the morph transition to show this final slide, which shows how hectares and acres look when they are overlaid on a map of central London, Hyde Park, and down the bottom right there is uh, Buckingham Palace. And you can see that a hectare is, or 100 hectares rather, is one square kilometre, and 640 acres is one square mile. So now you know. You know what the difference is between a hectare and an acre, and hopefully you'll have learned also something about um, animations in the process. Um, it's always worth looking into um, into animations. Using them purposefully can really make a massive difference to your presentation. So before I move on to my my final point, just want to talk about two um, two giveaways that I've I've got available. These are my top ten tips for slide presentations that will wow your audience and using slides and presentation. Um, sorry, using slides online and presentation tips, online presentation tips. To download them, all you have to do is scan that QR code or go to that URL, tspm.uk slash tips. And I've also included, I've snuck in uh, a PDF about my online course that, uh, that consists of 50 lessons, um, including a lot about animation, by the way, and also 76 techniques videos in the vault, which are PowerPoint techniques videos. Um, and if anyone feels they could benefit from this talk in their company, then I'd be happy to talk to you about delivering it or my full day corporate masterclass. And I'll put this slide back on at the end when we do the final Q&A, if you haven't had time to scan the QR code or go to that URL. So my final point is slides versus handouts. So this is a really awful slide. It's a slide that I use in my in my masterclasses, in fact, in an exercise called What's Wrong With This Slide? Um, and there are 17 things wrong with this slide, and you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go through all of those today. But this is the kind of slide that uh, the, the presentation where the, the speaker might say, don't worry, I've made all of my slides available as a handout. And you think, oh, my God, that makes my heart sink because I know that immediately that their slides are going to suck. So I want to talk about one of my biggest mantras, which is this. 
if your slides work as handouts, then they don't work as slides, okay? You may have heard slides referred to as speaker support slides. I want to get you away from that way of thinking and think of them instead as audience support slides. Your slides are there to support you getting your message across to the audience for the time that you are on stage or on screen. And luckily, there's a handy acronym to help you to remember audience support slides. And just in case you've got the wrong image in your head, here's a little picture to help you to remember audience support slides. So going back to this slide here, you can see it's the, about the marketing funnel, about the five stages of, of customer awareness. And I'm now going to present this to you in the way that I think it should be presented. And you'll see me do this already in this presentation by decluttering it. So let's have a talk about the marketing funnel. The first stage of the marketing funnel is awareness, where your customer becomes aware of you and your product via your marketing and social media. The second stage of the funnel is consideration, where your customer thinks about buying your products or services based on seeing further marketing and advertising. Then comes the all important third stage, which is conversion, where your customer actually spends money and buys your product and service. But this is not the end of the process because after that you want to engender loyalty in your customer and get them to come back and spend even more money and buy even more products and services. And then we have the holy grail of the marketing funnel, which is advocacy, where your customer shouts about you to their friends and family and their friends and family become customers of yours. So those are the five steps of the marketing funnel to loyal and engage customers. So I hope you all agree that was a lot better than the previous slide, the black and white slide. But we have a problem because if I now said, don't worry, I've made all of my slides available as a handout. Well, there's seven slides in this presentation and they don't contain much information because I was talking around those slides. Um, it would be seven pages of handouts on a PDF or a printout. And if you printed them out, you'd probably use up all of your ink cartridges fairly quickly. So... I don't believe I'm going to say this, but the original slide in terms of its content would have been better as the handout. But there are two ways of producing a much better handout than that original slide. You could design something like this. You know, you've got the same uh, funnel, the same font, the same uh, pictures of the guys on the right hand side, the, the colors and everything. But obviously, this is quite a quite a big design job. Instead, you can do something like this in PowerPoint. You can use the notes section in PowerPoint. So you Go to the slide at the end there with the title saying the five steps to loyal and engage customers. And then you put all of the text that your audience might need to take away as a handout underneath it. And it's not any more work because, well, you were going to put all that text on your slide in the first place. So put it in the handout instead. And what that does then, it means that your slides, when you're presenting to that audience, are congruent and work as your partner on stage. And your handouts also work as a handout when you give it to the audience to take away after the presentation. So the handouts are doing their job as a handout and the slides are doing their job as a slide. So I want to leave you with my final point, which is once again, if your slides work as handouts, then they don't work as slides. And we're now gonna move on to the, the final Q and A. Can we just leave just for a few seconds, just leave that slide on the screen uh, maybe just for 15, 20 seconds to give people a chance if they haven't already been able to do so to scan the QR code or type in or even write down that URL to go to it later to to download those um, those giveaways. And um, I'm just going to move on before we go to the Q&A. If you want to get in uh, in contact with me, these are my my contact details. I'd love to hear from you. Let, you. let me know what you think of the presentation or if I can help you at all in any way. So, um so that's it from me in terms of the presentation. Robert, have we got any more questions that people have been um, firing up? I think, I think you're on, are you on mute or is it just me that can't hear you? I am on mute, talking away. Ah, okay. <laughs> I can just check my speakers in to make sure it wasn't me that got Yeah, <laughs> no. So there's a question from Natalia that we missed earlier. It says, which are the best online tools that you recommend to make our presentations very dynamic and easy to create? I know that you glossed through a list of them earlier, but I, uh, Natalia is looking to see if she can get maybe some recommendations. And let, let, Let's phrase it this way. 
if you are a beginning to intermediate developer or presenter um, and you're doing some of the work yourself, where would you, what are some of the tools that are out there and which ones would you recommend to start with? Yeah, that's a good question because I, I always talk about PowerPoint as kind of being your final repository for stuff because you might want to bring images in from a, a picture right. library. You might want to be, bring sounds in. I do. I mean, I do. I haven't used any sounds in tonight's presentation, but you might want to bring audio in from a from a music library or a sound effects library. So, um, as I've already said, in terms of free images, I use Pixabay and Unsplash, and there are others out there that that we can get free images. Um, you can also generate images using AI now quite a lot, and I have done I have done that. Um, obviously, you've got to be a little bit careful when you're when you're doing that kind of thing. In terms of sounds, I use a a, a paid service. I think it's about ninety six pounds a year or something, or it's about one hundred and thirty dollars a year. Um, called Storyblocks, yeah, which allows you to download. I think um, I think you can also do video and pictures, but I tend to use oh, yeah. that just for for audio and for music and for sound effects. Um, what else? 3D models. Now, actually, PowerPoint itself contains a lot of 3D models in the stock section, but yeah. you can bring 3D models in or make 3D models and bring them into PowerPoint. So kind of, you can, you, know, you can bring images, you can bring sounds, you can bring 3D models. Um, you, you, you can bring all sorts of things in. So, um, so yeah, so those probably are my main source. And then, and then for image manipulation, there's a lot of image manipulation you can do within PowerPoint, mm-hmm. but I'll also use something like Photoshop. But of course, there are other image yeah. editing programs which are which are free or cheap um yeah. cheaper than photoshop where you can do the the image editing and manipulation yeah so you went you went through some of you said powerpoint you said google slide you said keynote i know you mentioned prezi at one point i don't know if you mentioned canva people a lot of people oh, yes, use yeah, people canva. Do use canva now. yeah yeah, I'm yeah not, i don't particularly i don't use canva only because only because i use powerpoint and most of my clients mm-hmm. do and also because i've been using um photoshop since version one i think back in 1930, 35 millimeter 1980s or whenever it first came out yeah <laughs> on, an apple, on an apple 2e with eight megabytes of yeah um, memory or something so yeah so that's pro- that's the reason i don't use canva just because i've, I've got used to the tools that i use yeah but, but yeah but, but canva can be a can be a great tool awesome 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 let's see if we can um steward is offering shared banks here i think let me see if there's another one that i missed um yeah, I don't think I don't think I see. Oh, any advice on how to take advantage of AI? You kind of you walk through AI just now, but it looks like somebody wants you to go a little bit deeper on how to use or leverage AI when creating presentations. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, the AI will certainly, um, from what I've seen, will certainly improve people's visual communication, mm-hmm. um, which is what I, which is what I've been trying to do for years. So I can't really complain if it does come along and do that. Um, I think from my point of view, it will probably wipe out the cheaper end of the, the market. Um, I think there will always be call for experts to produce um, to produce, produce presentations. But there's a, there's a thing, I think it's in beta still on PowerPoint called Copilot. They're bringing it into all of the uh, Microsoft yeah. Office applications, which will allow you to use AI to produce presentations. I must admit, I haven't used it, so I don't know exactly how it works. Um, you could, I mean, you can ask Chat GPT. You can ask Chat GPT to create you an outline for a presentation, yeah. um, and, and it will do that for you. And I have used, um, I've used Adobe Firefly to create images. Um, sometimes I was doing a presentation last month, I think it was, where a client wanted some very specific images, um, which I wasn't able to find on stock image sites, uh, and so I had them. I had AI create it, and they did. It did a pretty good job after a few tries, but it did a it did a pretty good job. So yeah. that, that's how I, that's how I tend to use AI at the moment. And obviously, AI is you know it's in its infancy. You yeah, get a lot of people, you get a lot of people out there saying, "Oh, AI can't do this, can't do that." But I think you know it can't do that at the moment. It's like a three year old riding a bike. Oh, three year old can't ride a bike properly, but you know, in fifteen years' time, they could be winning the Tour de France. So you know, it's it's AI is gonna it's, yeah. it's going it's going to increase in usage. Yeah. Um, and it may well put me out of business. I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it because you will continue to grow as well. I think you've got people on both sides. There's some people that say um, AI can't do this and AI can't do that. And then you have the other people who expect AI to be now able to do some uh, all of these things. I, I've had people that wanted AI to do a full presentation for them and then were upset because the slides didn't look sexy <laughs> or because... Yeah. It, yeah. You know, they looked pretty amateur in yeah. some cases. So 
um, you know, temper your expectations, be an early adopter, and also uh, be patient as the as the technology improves because it yeah. will improve. It pretty will improve. Quickly. Yeah. Temp- temper yeah. your expectations now, and um, and uh, but yeah, it will it will improve pretty quickly. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we look at what AI was at least publicly uh, two years ago yeah. compared to today, think about where we will be in 2026 with AI. Yeah. So we've, yeah. we've got a lot of a lot of stuff here. Awesome, man. So any 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 wrap up words for for our audience here? Anything that you want to point them towards if they're struggling with slide presentation still or don't know what they don't know? What are some additional resources that they should begin to access in order to well, get better? I, I, I could be very cheeky and mention my um, online course, couldn't I? Um, of course, that's, uh, that's a brilliant resource. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, um, and as I say, if you if you go to my if you go to my um, uh, that um, URL I showed earlier, mm-hmm. then I have cheekily snuck in my leaflet about the online course, which um, and and you can actually sign up for three three free taster lessons as well so you get an idea of of what it's about so um i would you know if you want to do that then then please do um but uh, yeah i mean it's like with it's like with learning anything there's a lot of information online um some of it of course is rubbish you've got to be careful some of it is 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 really good um (laughs) with any bit of software i would suggest that most of us probably only use it to it, you know, to twenty percent of its capability, yeah. which is fair enough because we're not using it all day long. I mean, I know PowerPoint inside out because that's what I do. I do, I design and produce slide presentations for my for my customers and train people how to use it. Obviously, um, so I think it's it's always good, you know, get into PowerPoint, have a play with it, have a play with the animations. Don't use them gimmick for a gimmick, you know. Use them purposefully, as I said. Keep keep rice in mind all the time, um, but just have a play with what it can do. And if you can, try and learn some of the shortcuts because one of the biggest problems I have, and I'm a bit of an impatient person, is when you're watching people using PowerPoint and you're going, don't, don't do it like that. You're taking too long. It's just yeah. taking 10 times longer than them, than they should be um, because they're not using it day in, day out. Yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the same on other bits of software that I'm not using all the time. You know, if I go into um, one bit of software I've got, which I don't use very much, is Adobe Illustrator. And I always struggle with that because I don't use it much. Whenever I go into it, I think, oh, got to kind of relearn how I did that because I haven't used it for a couple of months or something. Yeah. Fantastic. Listen, I, I remember as a high school teacher, I taught uh, high school science for a little while and I decided I was going to teach my students how to use PowerPoint. And these were ninth graders. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember the agony that I had to sit through as they discovered a lot of the different PowerPoint animations, but they seem to be quite fond of the typewriter effect and the oh yeah sound <laughs> yeah 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 and actually that's another another good point one thing you just uh, that just brought to my mind um yeah one of the things i always teach people and it's quite scary is and, and the biggest 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 problem with powerpoint is those really awful slide masters the templates because they're designed to make you present in a bad way you start the yeah. presentation it says do a title slide okay fair enough title slide that's not a problem you had a second slide, it's in suggests a bullet point slide. Yeah. That's how it's teaching you to present. So yep. what I say when I'm doing my master classes with people, I get them to um to, to think about deleting all of the masters in PowerPoint and then building them up again. Wow. To serve what you want to do within the presentation rather than having to f- constrain yourself to what they want you to do, which is to present really badly. I love it. I love it. Hey, everybody. This has been a fantastic session. Thank you, Dave, for hanging out with us and sharing with us. You know that he knows what he's doing because his site is called presentwithvision.uk, but he's also got a site that's called uh, The Slide Presentation Man. <laughs> Go, it goes, to the same, goes to the same site, actually, yeah. <laughs> there there yeah. we go. Awesome. <laughs> well, listen, if you want to get better at slide presentations and up your skills, definitely check out David Henson, and he will be the person, your resource to help you become even more powerful at PowerPoint. All right, everybody, this has been another Big View session. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me on the session. I'm so pumped that we were connected and I hope you found real value in what was shared. 
do me a favor. I want to continue the journey with you. Head on over to GetInTouchWithRK3.com. That's right, GetInTouchWithRK3.com. On that page, you'll find all of the different places on the interwebs that you can get connected with me. And there are also some great resources for you to download. Download them because they're designed to help you become better presenters, better communicators, and video storytellers. And that's what we need more of in this world, right? <laughs> Listen, get connected. Go to GetInTouchWithRK3.com. I'm RK3, and I hope to see you in my inbox real soon. Prompter, create videos you're proud of. Easily trim your video by selecting the words where you want to start and end. Color your presentation with automatic subtitles and highlighting keywords. Add your brand logo. Add music for an emotional touch. Add your contact info on an animated business card on all your videos. Easily replace green screen with an image or a video loop. Stand out with a web page with your logo, your video at the center, and personalized button for visitors to interact. It's one tap to simultaneously upload your videos on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Always know what to say next with the Big View Teleprompter.